You're listening to SM Media. Hi folks and welcome to your latest episode of the Celtic Report, your exclusive SM Media Celtic podcast. I'm Scott Pike. it's always a pleasure to be your host and I'm delighted to be joined by my special guest this week. It's a pleasure to welcome Michael Shearer. It's great to be back on the show and I'm very excited to talk about Celtic after quite an impressive display this afternoon against Hibernian. It's it's positive on the park. I think we kind of said, we both kind of said that off air. I, I think there's a lot of positives to take from from passages off the park and two wins out of two and we saw in pre-season. Off the park, though, it's, it's not great, which we'll get into as well. We didn't do a pod last week, obviously. Coman, the opening game of the season, 4-0 win. A lot of positives to take from that. I said on our prediction show at the start of the season, I thought a lot of Celtic's footballing work would depend on what happens with Matt O'Reilly. We'll get into that as well. I thought last week against Kilmarnock, there were certain points where I thought Celtic were unplayable. I thought some of the football was excellent. Do you go along with that? Yeah, I definitely would. I feel like watching this team, it's really began to adapt to Brendan Rodgers' methods. I feel like at times we wanted to make the comparison with Ange Postacoglu. And maybe some people thought that Postacoglu was going to get more out of the side than Rodgers did. But you're starting to see that really come to fruition now. And that's a team that won the League and Cup double last season. I mean, Rodgers' method, they're proven. For some people, the football might be a little bit slow. But as you've seen in the past two games there, when it starts to work, it's quite beautiful. And the goals they can create, the one-touch football. And with these players, they're younger players than maybe Rodgers has previously dealt with. And he's adapting the whole team. And he's doing the most with the players he's got at his disposal. And that's what every Celtic fan wants to see from Brendan Rodgers in his second spell at the club. Obviously, last week as well, one thing I kind of liked, particularly with the, the only change in the side from last season, which is the goalkeeper position, I thought Michael's distribution was a lot better. And I think that could be an important part of this. Even, yeah, even today, I thought there was wee points in that as well. I just thought he's a lot more comfortable in the ball than Hart was. And Hart still was a very serviceable goalkeeper. But I think Michael, in terms of distribution, is a bit of an upgrade. I think that's the difference you see between a goalkeeper that peaked maybe later in his career than Joe Hart, who peaked rather quite early in comparison, considering both of them came through at Manchester City at the same time. You've seen Michael's played in the Premier League a couple of years later than Hart, and the adaption to that sweeper-keeper position, and on the ball, it just looks so different the way he wants to play. At times he'll play it short to scales as quickly as possible, and then at times he'll take longer on the ball, and he'll place it into the wide areas. And then even today, there was a pass straight to Matt O'Reilly. And although O'Reilly was dispossessed, you can just see that confidence. I think that's the big factor. Joe Hart was confident in that he wanted to save shots, whereas Michael's also confident in the passing that he does. And that's going to be very important for Celtic. Maybe on a European scale, that they can't lose the ball as quickly as they previously done. But in Scottish football, it's going to make it even more difficult to dispossess them when pressing high up the pitch. And with teams like maybe Kilmarnock, you've seen last week, that at times they deal to go man for man with Celtic, and that wasn't working. And it'll be interesting to see when Celtic play Rangers in a couple of weeks, how Schmeichel performs in that atmosphere against Rangers, who will look to press and try and take the game to Celtic. Starting 11, obviously, was announced today for uh, Hibs at Easter Road. Exact same eleven that took on uh, Kilmarnock last week. I know, obviously, that you want a settled side and you want a team that is fairly consistent every week. But I think with the squad Celtic should have, there should be opportunity for rotation. I probably would have looked at the the centre back position today, even maybe even bringing in Bernardo, give kind of McGregor a rest or something like that. I'm not seeing it. I'm not, again, there's still a lot of time before the end of the window and it's, it's obviously something I want to talk about in depth later on in the show, but do you think there is the opportunity there for a bit of rotation or do you think it's, it's just a case of finding that consistency early on? 
I think he's trying to find that consistency earlier on. When it comes to the European scale with the Champions League, you'll see that rotation more. At this stage of the season, he's just trying to build something and work on what they've done in pre-season. I think we can see that it's working, and it's working very well, which it wasn't really working at this stage last season. So he's trying to build on that with the core players. And you may be seeing O'Reilly leave the club, which is very likely in the coming weeks. But for the rest of the squad, you're really starting to see it mould well together. And even players like Greg Taylor, who there might be that those little doubts about a contract situation, players like that are even just in the start of living. And it's just the core squad that's building. And it's quite exciting to see that Rodgers has just built a whole team in basically the matter of a season that fits his style. And everybody knows he wants to take it to the next level where he transfers off the pitch. But at his disposal, he's getting the most out of arguably every player in the squad. You look at Nicholas Kuhn, he kicked on this afternoon, and even James Forrest, he consistently has proven himself, even though there was doubts surrounding a player like him in January about leaving the club. And that's Rodgers at his best. He's turning players' careers around for levels that you wouldn't really have expected maybe a couple of months ago. It's very impressive to see on the part, as we say with Celtic, and what Rodgers and these players are doing. Didn't take long for Celtic to go in front. Obviously, there's a it's, a it's a weird goal. It's a good, it's a really really well taken goal when you actually look at it. Kind of four or five times. A brilliant pass to find Kyogo who does well. You're watching Kyogo though and thinking, why are you know squaring that to Kuhn? But gets the shot away. It's well saved. Forrest obviously does well to kind of tap onto the rebound. Cuts the rebound home and there's Kuhn. Brilliant finds a space and puts Celtic ahead. Overall, in terms of the goal. I think if it hadn't went in, there'd have been a lot of screaming towards Kyogo, but it works out. It doesn't look the most confident in front of goal so far in the two games, Kyogo. And I think Rogers even spoke about that after the game. He was talking about how he's not expecting him to score 40 goals. And it's maybe a situation similar to that, Ali Griffiths, when Brendan Rogers joined and how you've seen the other striker come in and play for two positions. And it, Rogers doesn't see a player scoring 40 goals and then maybe scoring 50 in his 20 as a downgrade because he's working on aspects of their game they maybe have not been as strong as. And with Kyogo, you see that this afternoon, but his link-up play has definitely improved. He just needs to find that killer instinct a wee bit more. And with James Forrest, that's so selfless. That's a veteran winger who knows exactly what to do in most situations. And I feel like people are more beginning to see that than they previously had. And McCoon, he really deserves that goal as well. That pass over the top so is brilliant. Him, it? It just... He always finds Kyogo with that yeah. pass, it seems. I'd, I feel like a lot of people don't seem to be talking about how good his vision is for a winger. He's yeah, got that yeah. ball over the top to Kyogo, and it's brilliant to see. And Kyogo loves that. And with Ida as well, sometimes Ida would look to run in behind. So Kuhn really just... It, Rogers even spoke about it after the game as well, saying that Kuhn is about moving inside, outside, not being predictable. And we're really beginning to see that. I think the one aspect he's giving me maybe struggles is he's finishing, but he scored in the previous two games. So I think that shows that pre-season has been huge for him. And he did have those dental issues, and I think he lost a little bit of weight when he joined. But with players that joined Celtic, maybe they, they need that pre-season. And he's beginning to look like a real player that's probably going to kick on to the next level. There was promise and signs about him when people looked into him at Rapid Vienna. And I think we're really beginning to see a player that's going to be a real star at Celtic this season. He just didn't give the, the left-back a minute's piece all day. And it's what you want with your, your winger, but as well, like, he takes on his man. And I don't think you see that a lot with modern-day wingers. Like they're, you know what I mean? they're wanting to cut in, but he can obviously cut in. He's good at that as well, but he takes on his winger. Do you know what I mean? He takes on the right-back. He's just, he's. I think he's close to a kind of all-round winger as you can get. He's obviously just going to get better the more he plays. To be honest now, like Maeda's going to get phased back in. And I thought Forrest was fine again today as well. He'll play his, he plays his part. Kuhn and Maeda look probably the two best wingers to, to start going forward, would you agree? Yeah, I think so. The only thing with Kuhn is he just needs to find that consistency. That's yeah. the hardest part of probably being a Celtic player, is living up to that standard week in, week out. Because even if you're a little off your game and you get substituted early in the game and an hour winner comes on and scores, that's you out the team. So that's going to be the hardest part for Kuhn. And with Forrest, you've got a player there who's going to challenge and compete with him. Not so much Yang, because we've seen with Yang, he's not lived up to that level just yet. But Kuhn, this is what we were sort of expecting immediately. And obviously there's been a situation with him that's been on and he's not been 
he's best feeling well, the dental issues, but this is a player we really all expected. And it's given say like that different dimension. Rogers sort of favours wingers who like to cut inside more. Yeah. And I think that was quite telling when he signed Kuhn, who was left footed and wants to play on the right hand side predominantly. That's more his style of play. And it's clear that that was a player that he wanted. We were not going to question Nicholas Kuhn and think, was that a player that the board signed or was it the recruitment team that signed him? I think Brendan Rodgers also played a large part in that. And that's very important in this era under Brendan Rodgers that he can sign the players that he wants that aren't simply just projects. Kuhn's obviously involved again for the second. Lovely pick out. Obviously lays it off really well for McGregor, which thunders at home. And again, McGregor's obviously somebody that I think even last week you just saw he looked back to his best. I thought he, he obviously had that wee injury that kind of nullified his season last year, but just looks back to his best. And Tati and O'Reilly do a lot of the work for him as well, let him just do what he wants. And again, really good goal. And a week where probably hasn't it been easy for him with the retiring for international football. Steve Clark will be watching that going, can I, can I know just have you again? Brendan Rodgers was very clear after the game about that and that he didn't actually push Carl McGregor to make this decision. It was more the sort of situation where McGregor came to him. Sensible says, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it makes the player feel that it's in their hands at the end of the day. And I know he is the captain, so this is going to prolong his Celtic career. And with the sort of person he is, he's the same sort of mould as Scott Brown with that mentality to want to go on as long as possible. And that's the sort of people that Celtic thrive on because they're not looking to spend as much money as possible. And with players like this, you're able to keep them going for longer and they understand the club. Having someone like that in the dressing room is just vital. And McGregor's just as good as they come. He'll be a player that people look back on in 20 years and just think how good he was and what he brought to Celtic. And to think that he'd went out on loan earlier in his career in Notts County to this stage being the captain and so vital to the side. He's just had an amazing career so far at Celtic. And on the international stage, I think even Scotland fans who don't support Celtic, maybe support other teams, will be quite sad to see. I know Scotland have a lot of options in midfield, but he kind of gives a different dimension in the, his all-round game as a midfielder. And that really helps Celtic in that balance in the midfield. It's there for all to see how good this midfield engine room works. And when Hattati, O'Reilly and McGregor are on their game, they are pretty much unplayable. First half, there was a lot of good passages as well. I, I really thought Celtic were just kind of torturing Hibs to be honest. I don't think Hibs are that good. Like, let's let's just be honest here. I don't think that's a good Hibs side. Celtic, though, were just really, really finding nice wee pockets. I thought some of the play, but I thought Hattati again. I've said a lot about Hattati this season. If he can stay injury-free, he's going to be player of the year. Like, I really think he's just finding that. He's level. the sort of player, if, if he's on the top of his game, he's the best player on the pitch. 100%. But how often is he at the top of his game? That's it's, it's that sort of midfielder. That I think we all know the Elk, yeah, midfielder, that on his day is the best player on the pitch. And you're very right to say that he could be the player of the year if he wants to. And Elk Rogers even spoke about that, I think it was last week after the game. Yeah. And that he's had that conversation with Hattati. And he even said that about pre-season, that he's only just seen the player he thought he was. Brendan Rodgers thought Hattati was. So that's an interesting comment for him to make. In terms of first half, though, obviously O'Reilly's kind of dominated the, the rounds for a wee while, but you just see again that it, it just seems to be maturing more as a player every game he plays because he just, a lot of the times early in his, early in his time at Celtic, he would play with his head down. He was, you know I mean, he was taking time to get used to the kind of responsibility he had. And now you look at him and just think he's, the, the, the difference in him in just two years has been unbelievable. It's obviously going to be difficult if he does go because it's a massive player to replace, but you're, you're looking at his progression going, he deserves that chance if it does come. I think with these players, they've got to pick the move carefully. I'm not saying they shouldn't leave Celtic, but they've got to pick the right club. When you look at somebody like Jeremy Frimpong, he picked the right club yeah. in Bayer Leverkusen to go to a club that's got young players and wanting to compete for league titles. But for a lot of players to go to the the English Premier League and is it a bottom side team that they go to and what happens after that year. So he's got to be very careful in who he looks to go to. There's some pretty decent sides in from like Atalanta and I Brighton. Atalanta and a great pick for him. But with Atalanta, it seems to be that they're wanting to make a big profit on him. So they're not wanting to spend as much as maybe a Premier League side can. And with the rules and regulations, you might see that he'll probably go to a Brighton because they do have the resources to buy players. 
But for Celtic, it's very clear that they want that twenty-five million. And even after the game, I heard Brendan Rodgers speaking about a player that Matt O'Reilly compared him to Nicholas Coon. He says, you can't be waiting until January to start scoring a goal for the team. So you heard quite a ruthlessness about Brendan Rodgers. And I hadn't really heard him speak like that about Matt O'Reilly. So there must have been talks behind the scenes last season about you need to start scoring more goals if you want to play on this side. And that's just worked perfectly for a player like that. Brendan Rodgers pushes these players. And with O'Reilly, I think we, we all knew that what he could be but he's even taken that to another level and it's arguably one of the highest bars we've seen of a player at the Scottish Premiership at his age as well. The value of him, you can compare him to any player that's played in the league at any time. His value is immense at what he's doing in midfield. It's a player we'll look back on and we'll think he was just brilliant. So for me, even if he does leave the club, I would want to see him go to the next level at a club that can take him to the next level at the same stage. So is it going to be in a European scale? You don't want to see him go to a mid-table side. And that could be frustrating for players that leave Celtic because the grass isn't always as green as people think. I do think Brighton would would work as well. I think with Atalanta though, like a very unique player, and I think Atalanta are a very unique setup, and especially in Italy, I think he would thrive there. But again, it's just in terms of money, is it going to work out? I'm not sure. We spoke about Kyogo. Now, it's going to be one of those days where you're going to look at Kyogo and think he did everything but score. But he does he does have these days, like, I mean, the, the work rate and the, and the IQ is always there. But, but there are days where he can just look completely useless in front of goal. But you just see just the intelligence that he has. It's the problem I've got though is we can see clearly that there was it was clearly there was, I don't think it was an injury. I think he picked up like a wee bit of a, a kind of hiccup of some kind. If that was to become an injury though, and, and I know the either thing is probably going to get resolved in the next week or so. If Kyogo's injured, that, that there's no depth. So needs address badly, but again, it's one of those days for Kyogo where literally did everything but score. I don't know if Kyogo's in a bit of discomfort when it comes to that shoulder. I remember being at a game last season at home against Dundee, and I was actually in the press room after the game, and Rogers had questioned about that, and he didn't want to seem to go into a lot of detail about what the situation is there. Yeah. So I, I really don't know if there is some sort of surgery Kyogo could maybe have on his shoulder that's been postponed. There has been rumours about that in the media, so it seems to be that he's maybe playing through a little bit of pain, and that would sort of explain why he's not been as clinical in front of goal as we expected in probably his first two seasons at the club. That would be the thing I could maybe understand of what's going on. It does seem like that shoulder pops so much and it's going to push back into place. You can imagine the discomfort he's in, but there seems to be more to that than that there's probably been a surgery that's just been maybe postponed or that they're just wanting to avoid him going to surgery for his shoulder. It seems to be something that's obviously going to keep popping back up. And maybe the longer it goes on, we could maybe hear more clarity for Brendan Rodgers on it. But that's my opinion of what's going on with Kyogo and why he's been wasteful, that there's something going on in the background with that shoulder. And it's every time a defender comes towards him, they're aware of that shoulder and what can happen. So you do see him go down. Maybe people would think too easy, but he's probably in a lot of pain. Yeah, yeah it, look, it does look at I didn't even kind of register that until you brought that up there. He did look a bit dis- like, discomfort. He does well, always was. look a wee bit in discomfort. Uh, and you look at him, that he's always kind of niggling. So he's maybe getting injections to avoid the pain and stuff. But I, that's just me surmising from an outside perspective. But it does always seem to pop up in games. The problem you've got with that, though, is if it is a case that he's... He is, and again, we don't know that, but again, it wouldn't mm-hmm. be surprising. If it is to then become a case of he can't play through it, it's a massive problem because... Whether you sign it or not, there's literally no more depth. And Mikey Johnson up front is just know. the amount of supporters I've seen commenting on social media about him coming on and and uh, your, your opinion on Mikey Johnson is whatever it is. But him playing up front, that's not his position, and it's a terrible position to be in at this stage of the season. And hopefully, the club can deal with it in the next coming weeks. And you've obviously had the thing as well. You've sold O, and I get why because I don't think O was ever going to be better than number two at the club and I, I get that and you've also like Rocco Vata I don't think would have been a number one option either but it's depth and if you are, if you have a striker who is so key like Kyogo and he's obviously I think he wants either because 
he is his type of striker. I think the one thing, the one thing I took away from the cup final last season was you saw how good he was. The fact that Ida was was his, was the kind of key player because he wanted him. It, it, I mean, he fits the Rodgers striker fit bill perfectly, but. He's also he's also coming with a lot of. Well, do you know what I mean? It's a massive outlay if they're going to do it for either, and we'll get into where he fits later on. But obviously, Kyogo, if he is kind of playing injured or discomfort, it's a big player. If if he's then going to just run out of steam, which mm-hmm. is more likely than not, because can he? Do you know what I mean? Like, still, it's August, and if he's playing through the pain now, it's only going to get worse the more games he plays. I know they've really got to manage Kyogo's situation better. With Ida as well, you talk about the fee that's getting banded around. The club did pay £9 million for Odds and Edward a couple of years ago, but that was really the anomaly in that situation. They knew what they had after a loan spell. And it even they've kind of stuttered more in this, but that's kind of quite confusing when you look at the bank balance at Celtic, that they're not as willing to pay that money for Adam Eda as they were maybe Odds and Edward. And I'm not saying that Eda's a better player or Edward's better than him. They're both pretty comparable in what they've done during their loan time at the club. So for Celtic, you've you've really just got to pay that money for Ida. As as long as it's maybe not over ten million, he's genuinely that good. He's he's the player that the club was crying out for when Yakimakis left. And his age as well. They signed a player in O who's just round about the same age as Ida to replace him and hoped he would be it. And the fell upon Adam Ida. And Ida's just he, he's Sometimes he's indescribable, I just what he brings to the Celtic side. It's everything that you would look in a striker who isn't Kyogo, the aspect of his game, his physicality, his hold up play, he's he's a brilliant player and also his Irish background following Celtic. And I, I imagine being an, a young Irish player coming to Celtic on loan yeah. and then you get back to Norwich and the deal's not happened right away. And I, I'm not making any excuses for him being late for flights and stuff, but you can imagine that he's went through quite a lot mentally. With that, with this deal dragging on, it's very clear that he wants to join the club. And to to see a player like him for Celtic in the Champions League, that that would be quite exciting because he's got a real quality that Kyogo doesn't bring when it comes to that physicality and aerial threat. So it would be definitely really exciting. And with, uh, with the club, it looks like they're waiting for O'Reilly to go and maybe Ida to come in. And in all honesty, I wouldn't be absolutely disappointed in that, but you would also like to see other signings coming in in the coming weeks. In terms of Ida, he's, he's a Range Rover away for throwing a Peter Odomwangi in and just turning up at Lennox Town car park. Like that, that, you can tell it's... I mean, I think the, I've, I've thought the Norwich manager's interviews have been comedy gold because he clearly knows that he doesn't want... He, like, he, he wants Ida to stay, but when, you, when the players sold himself on moving on then there's not really much you can do with it but in terms of second half there was, it, the tempo did drop I thought the defence apart from Greg Taylor I don't think it was the finest afternoon where are you at with Liam Scales because I remember having this conversation with you last season where at the point where he did come in and he was doing very well and he was that very reliable option but we're talking a lot about adding quality and I think we could it's clear that Rogers Navrotsky and Lagabelka are so far out of the picture that there is well just being their contracts ripped up, to be honest, because I don't see them getting away back in. But Scales has his weaknesses. Scales isn't a number one option. And I think that's a player you need to, I think that's a position that needs filled quality wise by the end of the window, especially going into Europe. That would be quite telling if they didn't sign a little defender in that position. Yeah. You compare him and Greg Taylor, a lot of people like to compare them. I'd say Greg Taylor's maybe a wee bit more quality in the left back position. He's he's not he's not at the Carter Vickers level, yeah. but going into the season in the Champions League with scales as your number one defender alongside Carter Vickers would be quite telling. No criticism of scales at all. I think he's doing the most of the skill set he has yes. as a player. But there's other players out there that the club could find and spend a bit more money on. But the question is, is that ambition there? That That's no Brendan Rodgers' ambition. Is, is the board's ambition there to take the club to the next level in Europe? With, with scales, he's done well. I, I maybe myself was a bit critical, critical of him at times. But he's, he's went on to another level that maybe even I would have anticipated. But there is better defenders out there. 
when it comes to playing out for the back, he doesn't look comfortable in that sort of style of play. But as you look at Alistair Johnson and Carter Vickers and Taylor, they're a bit more comfortable. They've played a bit more possession sides over their careers. Whereas when you look at Scales' career, it's quite up and down. He played in Ireland and he was in the university team. And then uh, I think it was Shamrock Rovers. He played in a back five as a wing back. And then he comes to Celtic. He plays as a full back. Then he ends up as a centre back. So it's all been a bit topsy turvy. And he's done the damn best he can with his skill set. So for Celtic, if they have any ambition, they need to be looking to get another centre back in the door. But when I hear stuff that um, Stephen Welsh isn't up for sale, he's not going out on loan. That really tells you they're maybe just looking as him for backup for that position. And as you rightly say, Scott, you would want more quality. But at this time of the season, we don't really see a whole lot of links with centre defenders for Celtic. And that's probably a little bit worrying. I don't think Celtic would lose the league with Liam Scales in defence by any means. But if you have that ambition to go on to win trebles and even progress in Europe, you need another centre back in who's an immediate upgrade. Because what happens if Carter Vickers gets injured? These players are human and injuries will happen over the course of the season. And you're saying that as well. I don't think Carter Vickers was poor today by any stretch stretch of imagination. It's but there was a couple of times today he did look leggy. Same with Johnson. I thought Johnson looked a bit leggy today, but you look at the summer they've had Johnson in particular and you go, that's understandable. But as the backup there, there's a massive difference. Like Ralston coming in for Johnson, you can see the drop. Carter Vickers has it takes that like probably Carter Vickers might not play next week, they might play well. So just get, you can see there's a drop though, and there's always going to be a drop when you've got players like Carter Vickers. But there's a lot of football coming up, and if they're leggy now, do you know what I mean? They're going to take a bit of time just to get that mojo back. And you saw that today, like as bad as Habs were in the first half, they did grow into it in the second half. And I thought it was a couple of times today, just that Boyle in particular was was getting a, a bit of a bit of joy out of the the way that like he was able to use his pace well against the the defense. And I actually thought Taylor was the best player, the best defender out of the four. But even his position needs upgraded because, as we say, there's no depth there either. Taylor gets injured, there's, there's a lot of trouble there. And his contract situation yeah, simply baffles well, yeah. me. I don't know if it baffles you as well, Scott. Course, yeah. you, you look at all the other players that's in a defence that's been handed new contracts, it's practically everybody beside them, and even players that's on the bench and don't look to be jumping into the first team set up right away. They've all had new deals, whereas Taylor... I think Rogers, by the way he was speaking in pre-season, it was quite damning that he probably had a talk with Taylor and says, I'm looking to get another defender in that's maybe an upgrade in you, because the way he was speaking, that Taylor didn't seem to want to sign the contract right away. So that's quite telling that we'll, pro- we'll definitely see probably a left-back come in in the coming weeks. And with Taylor, he's been a great servant to Celtic. I wasn't always his biggest fan, but you, you can't argue with players that's part of that successful period in the club. He might have his limitations. People always like to focus on his height, but really does he get beaten in the air? You know, yeah. you rarely see a goal that comes against Celtic that's a header at his side of the pitch. So for me, a player like Taylor's a wee upgrade in scales at his level, but it's just quite questionable what's going on with these contract situations. Is it Rogers? Is it the board? Is it Taylor's agent? That there's all these factors. At times you kind of look at the club and you're like, well, what's really going on here? But you get that all football clubs at I agree, you know what I mean? And it is that as well, obviously, with the, the kind of contract, but I don't think it was any secret that I think Celtic were in for the, the boy, is it Bueno, that went to Feyenoord? Like, there's clearly an interest there. There's clearly some sort of, of depth needed. Like, do you know what I mean? There's Scales is probably going to need to get moved if Taylor was to get injured. Or I don't see who else can go in there. Ralston. But, would cover there, but they, nobody really wants to see that. Do you know what I nah, mean? Like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that. That that shouldn't be the options they're left with. If that that kind of makes yes. sense. But thought today Taylor was solid. But like, again, he's very rarely does he have a bad game. It's just he's not. You can tell that if there's areas of quality, they can be added in that position. Celtic didn't really look troubled though. Second half, like they didn't look in, in much bother as as much as Hibs were grown into the game. The one thing that sticks out to me so far is, and we were talking about this obviously with depth, some of the subs. Now, I just want to run down the subs and get your thought on it. Like, you bring off Forrest, bring on Maeda, that's an upgrade. That's not not an upgrade, but quality for... Do you know what I mean? It makes sense quality-wise. Mm-hmm. At that stage of the game, back. it's going to make a difference. Yeah. yeah. Hattati for Bernardo, understandable as well. Johnson then comes on. Now, 
as honest as Mikey Johnson is, he shouldn't be anywhere near the squad in 2024. I mean, he really shouldn't. Do you know what I mean? It's not Especially his value at this stage as well. You yeah. look at it, and that's the most value you're going to get for him in the transfer market. 100%. I'm and a the Celtics transfer. Any links with him. And with Celtic's transfer policy, it's quite confusing why you wouldn't look to sell a player like that, especially given his age as well. You're going to get the best fee you can right now. Yang then comes on for Kuhn. Now, I think we've all kind of come to the conclusion where Yang is, there's something in there. It's just not Celtic quality right now. That's not to say it isn't in the future. Alone's probably the, the solution. Palma isn't on the bench, which I was quite intrigued by. Uh, Ralston comes on for Johnson. Again, a sub that makes sense. But Home then comes on for Johnson. I, I think I, I've liked the look of Home in pre-season. Do you know what I mean? I think there's he's a player I can see growing this, this season. But there isn't a lot of depth. There isn't a lot of quality depth coming in there. And I, I think that's something that really needs addressed because obviously the board are, I wouldn't say they're penny pinching, whether they're just waiting late and seeing what happens. But... There's clearly, I mean, looking at that bench, I don't want to be looking at the first of September and seeing Mikey Johnson as is your third best mm-hmm. winger. Like it shouldn't. That's that's not what this club should be doing. On Lewis Palmer, he's actually got an injury he picked up against Kilmarnock. Rogers spoke about that after the match, and that his ankle sort of moved difficultly. So it's going to be between ten days and two weeks before he comes back. He's quite a good quality player at having the bench. Yeah. But I, I get what you mean when it comes to strikers. In all honesty, they should look to sign two strikers, and that's going by Rogers' words and what he wants. He wants a second striker to challenge and compete with Kyogo, and a third striker who's maybe a wee bit younger, and the Rocco Vata Mole to be in around the squad and get those cup games. So with the rest of the squad, the quality is quite telling, but it's an interesting point in Celtic's history right now of where they want to go. Can they see that light to go to the next scale as a club in that European competition? There's been adjustments made to make it a little bit more competitive and in that you're going to have more games to play. Financially speaking, Celtic could reap more money if they're able to get to the next round of the Champions League. So that that's going to be telling if they're wanting to spend that money. With me, in the way I'm, I'm trying to look at things positively, are Celtic kind of looking for those tier of Premier League players that will maybe you'll see moving in the last week to a couple of days of the transfer window. And for me, that's Brendan Rodgers' market. He's not that ambitious when it comes to players abroad in Japan and thinking that they're going to come into the Celtic team and make a difference. Yeah. He's looking at your English Premier League Championship players. He's got connections where it would be agents. So with Rodgers, that's what you'll probably see. And I wouldn't be annoyed at that because I could see that coming, but in all honesty, they would need maybe five or six players because if you look back even a couple of years ago, there's been a hell of a lot of players that haven't been fully replaced. You look at players like Aaron Moy, that quality in around O'Reilly, they've not replaced those players like for like at all. And I do think that's what they're doing. I think it is because you are beginning to see, obviously, in the past week or so, like Man United are beginning to do business. Chelsea have obviously they are doing the business. They're doing they're doing business every ten minutes. Like is it a case of they're waiting on big teams making decisions that obviously means kind of players are getting shoved down the pecking order. Then they become available. That is what I can see happening. Or is it a case of we'll see what happens with O'Reilly and that can kind of make four or five Open players. Doors, yeah. yeah, but that that's. That's what I can see happening. Like obviously, there was links as well during the week for uh, Jeffrey Sloop. That makes a lot of sense because he's a player Rodgers knows well and he has that versatility that he can fulfil a number of positions. I think that could be a goer. It really depends if Jeffrey Sloop wants to come to Scotland yeah. at a stage of his career, I think, as well. Because he has a player that's been proven in the Premier League. He can play a number of positions. He can play as a left-back, wing-back, centre, midfield and even as a winger. So he's got that versatility. For me, a player like that, I don't think we'd come in to play as a winger. He'd be looking to compete with Greg Taylor for maybe yeah. his position. When it comes to midfield as well, you wouldn't be looking at that as a player who's going to come in to replace Matt O'Reilly. So I could only really see him playing as a, a wing-back and obviously he'll bring that pace and strength that maybe Taylor doesn't have. So it would make a little bit of sense, but the question for me is with these players that come from England, it's almost like a lottery at what level they're going to really be at. For every James McCarthy, there's uh, Adam Eda, do you know what I mean? It's quite hard to really gauge what level these players from England are at. And I think that maybe shows sometimes that the English Premier League can be overrated 
in comparison to Scottish Premiership because you can't just come up here and play and expect to be putting in 10 out of 10 performances week in, week out in first sloop. If they can get them for a, a reasonable fee, I'd be happy with it. But are you really need to see the eye test with those players and what they're going to bring at this stage of their career? In terms of the result, oh, clean sheet, lot to lot of encouragement to take from from certain passages of play. The next obviously week's gonna be very interesting. I do think there'll be a bit more links. I do think obviously the O'Reilly situation will heat up. I think from now until the end of August it's gonna be very fascinating in terms of the transfer market. In terms of in terms of positions that like where's the priority? Because obviously O'Reilly's if O'Reilly does go, where are you at in te- if I was to give you a percentage O'Reilly goes, O'Reilly stays, where are you at? Like give us a, a percentage kind of scale. Probably 70, 30, and it's 70% that he goes and 30% that he stays. Being that the amount of clubs that's in for him at this stage, and you, you think one of those clubs is just going to pay the fee, the Celtics probably requiring around 25 million for me. I would possibly want to get more from that really. You look at players like Elliot Anderson in the Premier League, yeah, and what yeah. they're going for. You can't even compare the careers of Elliot Anderson and Matt O'Reilly. So for me, I think he goes, and then maybe that opens doors. And but Rubin and Rogers even spoke about after the game today that they wouldn't immediately replace Matt O'Reilly's quality and want to spend in the transfer market. So that's just as telling as it is, Scott. And you look at obviously. Adam either I can see that picking up in the next few days. I think that'll be It's done. really got to with this Keo go sort of injury. Yeah. He, even a few of the newspapers were even saying that after the game. That like, realistically, you'd want to see Ida coming in in the next three or four days. And maybe that's me asking a lot to get that moving faster. But you hear the club's in advanced talks before it was talks, now it's advanced talks. So you're really hoping that there's just a an end to this saga, it seems to be. But that's just Celtic in a nutshell, and the two players they had in loan last season, they aren't, they aren't able to get them in the door as early as possible for pre-season. Do you think it's more a case of Norwich are looking at it going, we know we know he wants to go, but I mean, looking at Norwich's squad, and I, I, can, I watched them yesterday, it's not like they're, you know what I mean, they they are okay in terms of quality wise. Like I don't, I don't think Adam is a massive loss to them, and I I, I think like I, I'm I kind of don't know what I'm kind of trying to make out here, but obviously they get beat off Oxford yesterday. But I don't see Adam Eder coming in and absolutely try, like do you know what I mean? I don't see that. Like, oh, we, it's not as because we we didn't have Adam Eder. I think that the, the mind's already made up with the player and the club. I think it is just a case of they're trying to hold out for as much as possible because they know. Players desperate to go, managers desperate to do the deal. It's the balls in Norwich's court, and they can kind of ask for how much they want, and it's kind of up to Celtic to pay it. Like the fee was kind of quoted for about seven and a half. I think just in terms of his age and what he can do, like just his potential, I think you absolutely do the deal. But more for the reason is we know that Celtic have the money, and Norwich probably know that. So to me, like Norwich are holding all the aces here. And it's up to Celtic to just either do it or move on. They kind of have to do it now at this stage because yeah. any other striker they go in for, is it is that club going to look at it and say, can we get that money for our striker if Celtic were kind of banded around paying that for Ida? But Ida as well, a player like him, he's not going to immediately make Norwich City a Premier League team. It's, no, the Championship is way too competitive. Whereas the Scottish Premiership, you add that wee bit of quality and a Celtic team who dominate the ball and immediately Celtic become better. So it's, it's really quite hard to look at in that stage that Celtic with Ida is a far better side, whereas Norwich with Ida, you wouldn't say it really is a far better side. Norwich City is a competent championship team who are always on the verge of getting into the Premier League, and they've got options, experienced players up front like Ashley Barnes. So with, with Norwich, I think they know what they have in Ida at this stage now. They didn't in January, which... It's really quite baffling of what you look at what they were doing with either last season, whereas now a new manager comes in, gives them a chance in pre-season. Maybe either didn't want that, but for me, but either Celtic's kind of forced themselves into a corner here. He became a bit of a fan's favourite towards the end of the season, eh, last season there. You even see these celebrations after they won the league. He's a, he was a big part of the squad, I think. He was on holiday with James Forrest. Is it, this always happens with Celtic. They He's kind of immortalised now after that goal in the final, isn't he? Like, 
Mm-hmm. He's, do you know what I mean? Like he could last. There's so many late winners. winners. Yeah. You, you couldn't even, you couldn't really write this for an, even an Irish player to do this for Celtic. I know we have Liam Scales in the squad, but there's not been a, a lot of Irish players over the last couple of years, as it maybe was over the last decade, twenty years, and that's going to be a big part of the Celtic squad and him joining the club. He, he joined the club in a part in his career where he was doing well for the Republic of Ireland, but he wasn't scoring a lot of goals for Norwich. And for me, looking at that, that was hard to work out where he would fit in Celtic quality. Would he be Celtic quality? And he very clearly is. So at this stage, Celtic simply just have to pay the money. And as long as Norwich uh, don't take the mick by looking for more than £10 million, you've just got to pay that money for a striker. At the end of the day, that's how you win games. And he made the difference last season towards the end of the, uh, the season. Without him, they probably wouldn't have won the league. They probably wouldn't have won the Scottish Cup. So it's just as simple as that. And I think that's what baffles a lot of Celtic supporters. But when you see Celtic's got all this money in the bank, there was even that statement, I don't know if you saw a couple of days ago, that the next uh, interim report in the stock market is going to be even more money than Celtic anticipated. And that was even more surprising for me, having been that they already done that in the last quarter. So it's, it's going to be quite baffling to see if Celtic don't spend any money and then they announce a couple of months after that that they've made even more money as a football club with the revenue. So it it just baffles a lot of supporters. It's that double-edged sword though, isn't it? Is that you can see that the books are great, but you also, mm. like, as we say, we spoke a lot about it, the, the squad depth isn't there. And I, I do think that squad style is more than enough to win the league. I'm not disputing that. But in terms of Europe... Like, I really thought this would be the opportunity where Celtic could, like, I, I think the league stage is a tremendous opportunity for Celtic. Like, I really do. I think this could be a massive opportunity for Celtic to have a chance to progress in Europe. But you Look have... at Copenhagen. How, yeah. how, can, how can a club like that? It's very comparable to Celtic. Maybe Celtic's a more historical football club, but Copenhagen are probably at that same level. And it just shows you when you spend that money on maybe a Mohamed El Yunusi, players like that, yeah. it can make the difference in the Champions League. And Celtic probably got a, maybe an easier draw last season than they had in previous years, and they still weren't able to get out of the group. There's, they were still lacking that bit of quality. You've seen Mikey Johnson coming on against Lazio in games like that. that that's that's telling. We can all see. And where is that striving to go to the next level? That's what every football club wants. Because it makes no no sense to have money lying in the bank. Because at the end of, year, end of the year, that money's going to get taxed as well. Say, say you have twenty million in the bank, that's going to get taxed for the government. So what's the point just having it lying there, and then f- on the following season having more money just adding up? The, you could you could spend that money to put it back into the squad on wages. So it doesn't make a whole lot of business sense. I've heard a lot of people with regards to Celtic that have worked there in the previous years talking about the business model. So w- what is this? business model under Dermot Desmond? The other thing that I, I kind of think as well, looking at across the city is, is that, to be honest, Rangers don't seem much of a threat. And this is your opportunity just to put Rangers in the rear view mirror. But if... It is, yeah. And that's happened before. That That's the problem. That happened a couple of years ago and then Rangers won a league title. And then Celtic sort of go back into motion after that. So that that's the big issue that every Celtic supporter sees but it appears that maybe the board at this stage just want to win league titles and compete with Rangers. But the, 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 that's the hard part of maybe being a Celtic fan. You look at Rangers, do you want Rangers to qualify for the Champions League? Because then if Rangers start spending money, does that force Celtic into submission? It's a hard place to be as a fan to want your rival football team to be doing well in Europe so you can have that competition and you can strive to go to the next level. But that's, why I don't quite... get, that's why I don't get though. If that is the, the plan of let's see what Rangers do. That, that to me is just... I don't think Rangers would do that with Celtic, nah, do you know what I mean? It's nah, just, because, it doesn't make any sense. But Celtic, ha- Celtic hold all the aces here. Celtic can kick on. Celtic could realistically, do you know what I mean, spend their early money, no problem, and like three or four players, and be already a level above. They're already, in terms of squad, even with the kind of yes. lack of depth they have, they're still a lot far ahead of Rangers in terms of winning titles. It's more... It's more that you have saw, even under Ange, I, I saw this as well, they just didn't make their mark in Europe. And they should be for what they're doing. Like there's clubs that you mentioned, Copenhagen, Club Bruges been another one, even the likes of Salzburg, they're making marks in Europe. Like uh, Celtic aren't doing that. Rangers aren't really doing it either. And although Rangers had good European runs, Champions League Rangers were annihilated. Celtic, 
well, haven't been annihilated in the Champions League, but I think that's just into Rogers though, and his style of player yeah. maybe be a bit more solid to keep on the ball. I think Rogers is more suited to to Champions League than Ange was. Like definitely, definitely. So I can, I mean, it's still there's still twenty days of the window, but to me, if there's, I think it'd be a real bad situation. I think it would get a lot of people angry if Celtic didn't. If Celtic were very busy from now until the end, end of the window. And you can see the the quality as well. Like, like you can see those areas needed. You can see, I mean, although that I mean, pretty much that's the same team as last season, with the exception of maybe Kuhn coming in instead. Do you know what I mean? There's not a lot really of... one player down with either towards the yeah. end of the season. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And Rocco Vata. So you're talking about maybe a couple of players down. Yeah, but I I do obviously think they will be busy. On to next week, obviously, Hibs at Parkhead in the Cup. Obviously, at, in terms of kind of rotation, I think home needs to come in. I think he deserves an opportunity to to start a game. I don't know whether we'll be too much rotation because it is just a game a week just now, as you say, he's wanting to find that consistency. I think it'll be very interesting who starts up front because will Kyogo get a rest? Will either but, be there? I, I doubt either will be there by then, but... They might come on or if they start, but that that's an it's an interesting it's going to be an interesting game. Obviously, this was the point last season where, uh, obviously the situation with the the Kilmarnock game it was obviously quite a, an early blow. Obviously, been at home it will probably change, but it's going to be an interesting game next Sunday. You, you talk about a player at home. I don't know if he trusts him to start him in place of Callum McGregor at that position as a holding midfielder. You maybe see a Bernardo come in for a Hattati, but I don't know if you see. Callum McGregor get benched for this game, considering he's retired from international football. You might start to see him playing even more games in Cups than he maybe previously did, and that's quite an ask. With the rest of the squad, you're most likely definitely going to see Ralston playing at right back. I think Johnston suffered a bit of an injury this afternoon, so he would be a little bit of a doubt. It's centre-back. Dennis Arrow Mc... play? Sinister, that, that's a good question. Possibly could, considering that he's actually coming to be competition for Schmeichel. That like Sinisal was a starter week in, week out last season. Mm-hmm. So it, it'd be interesting to see how he plays. I've, he got, a few, fr- I've got a few friends at Air. They rave about Sinisal, like how good he was at Air. Like, mm-hmm. like there's a lot of hope that he's going to do well at Celtic. There was a few questionable moments in pre-season. I think there was a few goals they conceded. Maybe people were a bit worried, but it'll be interesting to see. It's about would Rodgers want to take that risk against yeah. a Hibernian side? How big is the, the gulf in class between Celtic and Hibs that they can make these changes? That's the risk they take. Carter Vickers, I feel like they're already pushing him to a level that you look at him this afternoon. He was There was points he looked a bit uncharacteristically clumsy. He didn't give away any goals or anything like that, but he was he didn't look himself completely, and I think that's down to fitness and fatigue. With Greg Taylor, I, I don't see anybody else playing his position. So you could see a Hattati, or even O'Reilly. O'Reilly might not be here in a week, we don't know. When it comes to up front, that's the big question. I don't know what will happen with Mikey Johnson, considering what happened to him this afternoon. You talk about a Yang... Uh, Maeda, there's players like that that could come in with Maeda, that would be a perfect opportunity to build on his fitness for from the injury that he suffered and with the striker, Kyogo you look at that, I don't really know what they can do if, if they want to rest Kyogo at this stage, you're practically but, looking to force wingers into a striker position yeah. just because you've been inactive in the transfer market, it's kind of just it's amateur at this stage of the season it's going to be interesting what happens in the next uh, week or so, obviously. We will be back, not next week, week after. We will obviously be back for the next league game in St Mirren away and we'll be looking at what could be a very busy couple of weeks for Celtic. Michael, always a pleasure to have your company, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me again, Scott. It's been a pleasure dissecting Celtic. And we will see you all in a couple of weeks for more Celtic content. Tune into our SM Media Celtic channel on social media and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. 